Hi, uh, this is Brahan Shetty. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, machine learning trustworthiness. So the title of my talk is um, State of the Model, Promising Steps and Remaining Challenges Towards Trustworthy Machine Learning. So to set the, the scene here, um, let's consider this setting where we have a supervised learning task uh, and the goal is to, to train a model or a classifier, such as a spam filter or malware detector or an image classification model. And the way this happens is through this pipeline, typical uh, pipeline in machine learning, which is where we have a training data, which is labeled, and we will run this through a typical training uh, pipeline and produce a model F. Uh, and in modern days, this is typically a deep neural network. Uh, and then we deploy this model as, a, as a, some sort of prediction API and users would send inputs uh, to this model. So the prediction API and get a, an output um, or a label of a specific input. Okay, so that's the, the setup we will consider. Um, so when we talk about machine learning, the progress in machine learning today, uh, we've got two sides of the story. So there is this exciting side where machine learning uh, does a lot of amazing things. And we also have the opposite or somehow the darker side of uh, machine learning where uh, the, the machine learning model could do a lot of crazy things. So if we start with the bright side, we have seen progress where machine learning models these days are good at uh, image classification tasks in computer vision or in uh, domains, safety, safety critical domains like autonomous vehicles uh, or even in domains where uh, we do tra uh, translation of languages. Uh, in the medical setting, we have also seen uh, models which are pretty close to human accuracy in terms of detecting um, cancer. Um, and We've also seen examples where uh, models could beat you know, professional uh, gamers. Uh, and we all have recently seen examples where uh, audio assistants or voice-based assistants could be used for a number of predictive tasks uh, in our houses. So that's the, the, the nice side or, or the great side of uh, the progress we see in machine learning. The, the flip side, or what I call the worrisome side of machine learning, is uh, could be summarized with one uh, question here, which is in the pipeline that, that I gave you earlier, what could possibly go wrong if we replace the user here with some sort of adversary who has some malicious intent, right? Uh, so because the adversary could do a, you know, a great deal of manipulations of the input or maybe try to manipulate the training data uh, for fulfilling the adversarial goals. So um, in, in the sense of this adversarial setting where uh, the adversary could come with a lot of intentions, there are um, a couple of scenarios that we've now witnessed that you know, um, machine learning is not secure or safe. Uh, so the first one is what we call data poisoning attacks. So in, in this setting, the goal of uh, the adversary is basically to inject some training samples. So the samples should be carefully crafted so that the, the model's decision would be skewed or somehow uh, influenced uh, towards uh, producing an output that the adversary wants. So the way this happens is when machine learning models such as spam filters or recommendation systems or malware detectors that have to collect data from untrusted sources and merge that collected data into their original training set in, in the hopes that they would improve uh, the accuracy of the model. So what, what they merge um, into the original training set uh, is or could be a, a, a poisonous kind of training data that is intentionally devised by adversaries to, to reduce the accuracy of the model or maybe to bias the model to a specific kind of label. Um, in real life, we have seen many examples where training data has been poisoned. And back in 2016, there was this uh, infamous um, chatbot from Microsoft 
which was train, retraining itself from data that it was getting from people online. And it all, it, within a span of hours, uh, it, it just turned to be a very racist uh, chatbot because it, people were feeding uh, this chatbot a lot of crazy content, which is motivated by race or politics and things like that. So that's about uh, um, poisoning. The other common um, uh, attack uh, or threat that uh, we see in the machine learning uh, setup here is what we call adversarial examples. So this is a very famous uh, attack vector where the goal here is given an input X, the adversary would perturb or modify this input in a non-random way, in a very calculated way uh, to produce um, what we call uh, an adversarial example. And that adversarial example is going to be misclassified by the model. So the goal is essentially uh, by performing minimal perturbations on a given input, let's say an image, and without changing the visual, um, you know, the visual appearance of the image, uh, the adversary would fool the model. Um, so for this, we have seen more than uh, enough examples. So uh, in image classification, people have dem demonstrated this is possible. Uh, even in more safety uh, sensitive uh, domains like healthcare, we have seen models uh, misclassifying an, a tumor to the wrong class, which means basically misdiagnosing a patient. Um, and we have also seen cases where a stop sign could be misclassified as something like a yield sign, which obviously has safety implications in autonomous vehicles. Uh, and even in uh, uh, voice uh, commands, we have seen how to fool voice commands uh, in voice assistants. And beyond computer vision or the audio domain, we have also seen cases where malware detectors could be fooled by uh, just minimal changes made to, let's say, Android APKs or Windows executables uh, without changing the malicious behavior of the samples. And the other kind of attack is what we call model extraction attack. Uh, model extraction is, uh, is motivated by an adversary who wants to either steal a model for, let's say, reasons like intellectual property or national security um, secrets and so on. So the, the idea here is by interacting with the model, uh, the adversary would use the model as an oracle to label you know, a bunch of data uh, items. And then uh, using this labeled data set, the adversary would train what we call a substitute model. Uh, and this substitute model is uh, functionally equivalent to the original model. Uh, model. And in, in, in doing this, what the adversary achieves is the adversary basically gets uh, an almost uh, exact copy of the original model. And now, uh, if, if the original model was based, trained based on, let's say, a huge amount of data that was collected over a number of years, and that happens to be an intellectual property, or let's say even were in the worst case scenario, it is based trend based on let's say a national security uh, secret of a nation, uh, then the adversary effectively steals that uh, knowledge or that um, uh, model. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to the three attacks I described, uh, model uh, machine learning models could also be uh, vulnerable to what we call membership inference attacks. These are privacy motivated attacks where um, the goal of the adversary is by simply inspecting the model predictions, uh, they want to probabilistically determine whether a sample was used to train the model or not. So the intuition of the attack here is based on how machine learning models generalize when, when they are trained. So uh, the common observation we have about machine learning models these days is that Machine learning models tend to overfit on their training data, which means a model would be more confident in its predictions when it sees um, members of its training set. So by exploiting this behavior or statistical distinguishability of how the model behaves on members versus non-members, an adversary could build a probabilistic or a threshold-based uh, you know, identification or inference model that would tell it, okay, this looks like a member of the, the training set uh, versus this other sample, which doesn't have a good score of being a member. So the implication for this is 
uh, since this is a privacy motivated attack, the implication for this is that uh, if a model is trained on, let's say, hospital data set or medical records, uh, if the adversary is able to identify a person, this is obviously a privacy breach. Um, so the consequence is uh, uh, is going to be bad, obviously. All right. So so I, I kind of gave you an overview of the four different attack vectors that we have um, fairly understood at this point are pretty important in the machine learning pipeline. So what I'm going to do in this in the rest of the talk is I'll take two of these four, uh, namely adversarial examples and membership inference. So adversarial examples for fooling the model, membership inference for basically inferring a, uh, a record of uh, a record used to train a model. Um, so in the first part, I will, I will focus on this moving target defense that we've recently developed uh, to improve upon existing defenses against adversarial examples. Uh, and in the second part, I will, uh, I will, I'll move into this other defense that focuses on defending models against membership inference attacks. And this is based on what we call preemptive exclusion of the data points. And uh, in the third part, the final part, uh, I'm going to come back and try to tie back what I, whatever I'm going to talk about uh, with the title of my talk, which is the state of the model. So where do we stand in the state of the robustness of machine learning model or trustworthiness of machine learning model? Uh, and I'll, I'll take a broader perspective uh, beyond the two kinds of attacks that I'm going to describe and you know, the progress we have made uh, in defending against adversarial examples and also membership inference. All right, so let's jump into the first part. So in this first part, I'm going to talk about this recent work that we've done called Morphin. So the idea for Morphin is basically to make the machine learning model uh, a moving target in, in the eyes of the adversary. So before I get to Morphin, um, uh, it's, it's fair to kind of assess where we stand in terms of the progress we've made in adversarial examples uh, defense arms rates, right? So um, adversarial examples are dated back to early 2000s. And um, the landmark paper that kind of uh, introduced adversarial examples in the sense of deep learning is the 2013 14, uh, 14 uh, um, paper uh, from Google that looks at you know, these intriguing properties of adversarial examples where they could be fooled with uh, simple uh, perturbations. After that, uh, defenses have emerged in many directions. So uh, the early defenses looked at uh, gradient-based um, attacks, uh, and uh, they, um, they, they wanted to defend against this uh, gradient-based attacks because the attacks were exploiting the gradient information. So the, the defenses were you know, obviously based on um, uh, doing things like gradient masking or refining or pruning the model or performing uh, some transformations on uh, the, the inputs or the data. And then uh, around 2017, uh, there was this uh, um, seminal paper by Carlini and Wagner, which uh, broke uh, what was the state of the art uh, defense at the time, uh, defensive distillation, and uh, later, a series, of def, um, uh, a, a series of attacks by Carlini and others uh, broke most of the defense that we were proposed against adversarial examples. Around 2017, uh, there was a, a new defense called adversarial training. So basically training the model or introducing the model to adversarial examples uh, so that when it sees the, these examples in the future, it can uh, correctly classify them into the right class instead of the, the adversarial class that the, the adversary wants the, the sample to fit into. Um, so as we speak, adversarial training um, is fairly fairly um, good, but it, has, it comes with its own costs, uh, which is um, when you train a model in an adversarial setting, you are feeding the, the, the training pipeline with adversarial examples in addition to the original training points. Uh, so uh, there is a risk of, um, you know, penalizing the clean, uh, clean input accuracy of the model. Um, around 2019, uh, and quite recently, we have also seen a surge in uh, this direction of certified defenses, uh, where 
uh, the idea is to provide a minimum robustness guarantee under a specific setting, for example, the LP norm uh, kind of, um, yeah, distance measure of images um, so, so that the, the, the user of the model would have you know, the, the, the lower bound on the accuracy of the model under attack. So if, if I guarantee that your model won't go beyond, let's say, 55% accuracy under attack under a specific class of attacks, then when you deploy the model, you already understand that there is a certification uh, up to a certain degree. Um, and you know um, it's up to you to deploy the model uh, given the certification I gave you. So it's basically giving a proof or uh, telling the, the user of the model that you know um, here is a guarantee I can give you, but it's up to you to deploy it. So this certified defenses come with that kind of guarantee, but they do also have uh, their own limitations in terms of scalability and covering you know, different uh, classes of attacks. All right, um, so beyond what I said uh, about this different classes of defenses, what is common to all defenses up to this point, up to you know, certified defenses, is that they all treat the model as a fixed target model. So uh, if an adversary tries to attack your model once uh, and the, the attack succeeds, the adversary can come back and attack the model because the model doesn't move or the, the model is, uh, is not changing. The decision boundary of the model is basically the same. So that's, that's where we, we come in with this new defense technique uh, uh, called morphins, which as I said earlier, is based on moving target um, idea. So the idea here is we're going to deploy a pool of models where the decision boundaries of these models are slightly different, but the overall accuracy comparison between these models is the same. Uh, so what we do is when the adversary comes in with an input X, we pick one of these models, and that model would predict the output of uh, the input. And then when the adversary comes with another input or even the same input again, what we do is we keep moving these models or picking a different model, uh, which is you know, as accurate as any other model in the pool uh, so that the adversary who is trying to establish, let's say the decision boundary or the robustness the sensitivity of the model against different perturbations would be discouraged and eventually give up uh, in terms of the attack that it is planning to launch against this model. So that's the idea. Uh, so to give you a little bit of context as to how our approach works, here is a brief overview. So given a model that is trained on a specific training data set, the first step that we do is what we call seed pool generation. So but as I said, we have, we have a pool of models that will act as a moving target for for the adversary. So what we do is given the weights of the model, uh, what we do is we just perturb these models in a very bounded way um, and generate what we call uh, the initial seed of models. Uh, and this initial seed of models, since we perturb the weights, um, um, is bound to be less accurate compared to the original model. Therefore, we have this second step what we, uh, that we call seed pole retraining, which is basically uh, aimed for two goals. The first one is, of course, we want to gain accuracy back. And the second is uh, we have to also create sufficient diversity between uh, the individual models that we forked from the, the original model. Because in adversarial example uh, literature, there is this phenomenon called transferability of attacks. So if, if you attack one model with an adversarial example, um, chances are the, the, the attack would work on another model, even if these models are architecturally different. So to minimize that transferability, uh, we also apply different transformations on the different, uh, the, the, the original data sets. So the T1, T2 up to Tn here indicate the unique transformations that are aimed for getting the diverse models. Uh, and after doing that, we will get a, you know, a fairly diverse model and we will also get a, a gain back the accuracy of the individual models. And then in this third stage, what we do is what we call selective adversarial training. So as I told you earlier, adversarial training is sort of the benchmark defense that we use because that's as far as 
we knew at, uh, at the time of you know, developing more fence, this was the best defense. So what we do here is instead of training all of the models in, in adversarially, what we do is we pick a subset of the models and train them uh, adversarially. So advers apply adversarial training. Basically, we introduce these models to adversarial examples. And the reason why we are selective here is because if we train every model in the pool um, with adversarial examples, they would be great at catching adversarial examples, but they would penalize uh, overall accuracy on clean examples. So to balance for that, we, we, we keep the, the remaining subset uh, of the models as is to make sure that you know, we're not losing on uh, clean example accuracy. Um, and finally, uh, we deploy this you know, pool of models, which is a mix of adversarially trained and also the originally uh, improved models. And then we have what we call a scheduler, which basically accepts an input and then performs the moving target aspect of the, the, whole, the whole pipeline here. Uh, so uh, when we do scheduling, uh, we have to also make sure that the pool, the model pool that we produce after passing through these three stages should also be replenished or it should be renewed because if the model pool remains static, again, we're back to square one, which is, you know, the adversary would, would recover or discover some, um, some information about the fact that, okay, it looks like I have kind of saturated this model pool. So now I know that this is a pool that never changes. So to, to avoid that kind of risk, what we want is we every maximum number of queries, we want to just run the, the pipeline one, two, three here and produce another pool of models. So another batch of models will be deployed. And that way, the, the, the moving target aspect will continue by updating the model pool. Okay, so that is basically how our system Morphins operates to achieve the moving target aspect of uh, the defense here. So let me give you a bit of a highlight of how this uh, defense uh, performs and how it compares against the state of uh, the art uh, at the time, which is adversarial training. So here uh, we've got different kinds of attacks. So fast gradient sign method, Carlini Wagner and SPSA. So fast gradient sign method and Carlini Wagner are white box attacks where the adversary knows um, you know, the gradient and you know, uh, details of the model while SPSA is uh, an iterative black box attack. So uh, this is the accuracy of the, the model uh, when there is no attack, so it's a you know, a fairly good accuracy uh, of that. Uh, this is, by the way, for the MNIST dataset, um, the benchmark uh, toy dataset for image classification. Um, and when we apply fast gradient sign method, um, uh, you can see that the accuracy just drops to almost 10% from 99%. Carlini Wagner basically um, paralyzes the whole model, so zero. Uh, it's a very strong white box attack. And SPSA also um, um, drops the accuracy up to um, roughly 50%. Then when you look at adversarial training, um, obviously it, it improved up on you know, the accuracy, the accuracy under attack, uh, for example, for FGSM up to 42%, but it fails to recover from uh, Carlini Wagner and it fairly improves uh, the SPSA uh, from the SPSA attack. But when you look at this last column, which is our defense, Morphins, you can see that Morphins doesn't really incur any cost on clean label uh, uh, accuracy or clean data accuracy. Uh, you would see that uh, it is almost the same as the original, the undefended models accuracy. So we're good on that. And when you compare it uh, against adversarial training on all these attacks, you can see that uh, Morphins um, outperforms uh, adversarial training uh, with a very large margin. Um, we also tested Morphins on another benchmark data set slightly more complicated than, C uh, than MNIST. And this is called CIFAR-10. Uh, so um, the, the conclusion here is that Morphins again outperforms adversarial training uh, uh, in all cases, as uh, it can be seen here. 
So the takeaway for um, for the Morphin's evaluation is that um, the the moving target aspect is really working. Uh, so what it ensures is that it, it is much more robust than a fixed target model, obviously. Um, uh, it can also prevent falling victim to the same attack multiple times. So we have uh, you know, details of evaluation in, in the actual paper. Uh, and the iterative query-based attacks uh, like SPSA that we have evaluated, uh, they are very uh, unlikely to succeed in the face of a moving target model. So we've we've um, kind of understood or you know uh, learned these lessons by applying this moving target uh, strategy against um, adversarial examples. So the second part I'm going to talk about is uh, about membership inference uh, defense. So we have this uh, upcoming paper uh, called Mia Shield, uh, defending membership inference attacks using preemptive exclusion uh, of the member data points. So um, like I did for adversarial example, I want to highlight a little bit about the context here because you know, uh, later on when I talk about our defense against membership inference attacks, uh, you would realize how, um, what we are improving on. So membership inference attack in the context of machine learning was um, introduced in back in 2017. Um, and after that, there were you know, a range of defense techniques that were um, proposed um, spanning different strategies. So there is this regularization based uh, uh, defenses, uh, differential privacy is another one, or masking uh, the confidence of the model. Uh, remember when I when I introduced membership inference, I said the adversary exploits the confidence of the model on members versus non-members to differentiate members from uh, non-members. So if you do some sort of masking of the confidence without, um, of course, affecting the accuracy of the model or the label of the model, then you, know, you, can, you can gain back some robustness. Uh, and there's also another class of uh, defenses called ensemble methods, so which is basically, you know, stacking machine learning models so as to confuse the adversary not to establish any, any intuition about, you know, whether a sample is a member or not. And then lately we've got what we call knowledge distillation, which is uh, based on making, uh, basically pruning the model so that the model doesn't leak too much information about members. Um, Similar to what I said for adversarial example defenses, what is common here among all these defenses is that they are based on this idea of masking or concealing the presence of a member. So basically, all techniques up to this point are what, what they're doing is the member the the member element is in the in the models. So we want to protect, let's say, you know, uh, a patient's record uh, that was used to train a model. What we do is we do our best so that the adversary doesn't, doesn't really you know, discover that the, the item or the data point is uh, not in the model. Uh, so it's basically based on masking or concealing the fact that the, the data point is in the, in the training set. So what we say for the intuition we have for our defense technique is, so it is well established that the presence of a data point offers a strong membership signal for inference. So the question we ask is, how about excluding the data point, of course, without compromising you know, the accuracy of the model, so that this signal the adversary gets would be weak, and as a result, maybe the attack would fail, okay? Uh, so basically, we're, we're departing from what has been done in the literature in the sense that Instead of masking, we are basically excluding the item or the data point so that any probabilistic inference would be at best a false positive. Because if I remove the training point and I still give you the, the same utility or accuracy of the model, uh, any, any conclusion uh, you make as an adversary uh, would be a false conclusion because the, the data point doesn't exist. Okay, so there is that, you know, theoretical guarantee that we don't prove here, but uh, we'll see how, how this approach uh, turns out to be. 
So here is a highlight of how MIA Shield or our approach defense of a uh, membership inference works. So as I said, the idea is we want to preemptively exclude the member uh, when we respond to predictions of the model, uh, uh, predictions of an input. So uh, the idea is given a sensitive data set, let's say a patient record data set D, what we do is we wanna first split this data set into disjoint subsets, let's say D1 to Dn, and we apply data augmentation to gain back accuracy that would be lost to uh, this disjoint splitting of the, the, the original data set. And then we train uh, the model, uh, the individual models uh, after this data augmentation step and produce N models corresponding to the N disjoint uh, data, uh, data sets or subsets. Um, and once we have these models, what we do is when we get an input from an adversary, uh, we will leverage what we call an exclusion oracle, uh, which would first decide whether the input X is, uh, is uh, or belongs to one of the training sets of these models, F1 to F8. If it belongs to one of these models, what we do is we will exclude that model from the ensemble prediction that we are going to compute over here. So y equals ensemble of f1 to fn. So if fi, model fi, contains the input x, we will exclude model fi and perform the ensemble prediction or aggregation on the rest of the models. So basically what we're doing here is since the signal, the model that carries the signal, which is the, the target data point X here uh, is, is identified through this exclusion oracle. We exclude that model from participating in the predictions, uh, but we still want to maintain the, you know, the, the accuracy of the model. Uh, so the, as you might imagine, the challenge here is as to how we have to design this exclusion oracle, because that seems to be sort of the, the bottleneck here if the exclusion oracle gets things wrong, um, you know, the whole pipeline or the whole defense strategy would fail. So in the next slides, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you a highlight of, you know, different strategies that we explored for how to implement this exclusion oracle. Okay, so we've looked at five different techniques, um, uh, starting with, you know, um, a basic naive baseline. So that's, so the first technique that we used is what we call um, model confidence-based exclusion. So what we do here is to exclude uh, one of these models from the ensemble prediction, what we do is we exclude the most confident model on a given input. So given an input, we look at the confidence of all these models, we exclude the most confident. And the intuition here is that it goes back to the, the original intuition of um, what is the root cause for membership inference attacks. It, it is the fact that models are more confident on their members. So the most com by the same token, this, the most confident model in this scenario is likely the model that contains the inputs. Okay, so that's the basis for using this strategy. As it turns out, uh, the limitation of this technique is that the most confident model is not necessarily the most the model that is trained on the target data point. So we've empirically uh, validated that this, although this is a good baseline or starting point as, as a, an Oracle exclusion Oracle, uh, it's not the best. So as a result, we had to explore other alternatives. So the next alternative exclusion strategy we looked at is what we call exact matching based exclusion. So the idea here is since we can compute you know, hash values of like cryptographic hash values of the individual data points in each subset, uh, what we did was we, com we, we basically compare the inputs hash value to you know, the hash values of the data points in each subset. So whenever we find a match, we exclude the model trained on a sample that exactly matches the inputs, okay? Um, since this is an exact matching technique, the limitation, the obvious limitation to this is when you slightly manipulate an input, specific, especially an image, 
uh, that slight manipulation, let's say one pixel change, would mislead this um, oracle. So it's not it's not a very effective technique. It works when the exact match is found, but it it, it fails when uh, the mani uh, slight manipulation is there. So so incrementally, we went to the third uh, alternative, which is instead of exact matching, why don't we do approximate matching uh, based exclusion? So the difference here is that we just exclude the model trend on a sample that approximately matches the input. And one way to do this approximate matching is still on a hash value comparison or hash value lookup, but the hash function or method we use is a, um, perceptual hashing technique instead of the cryptographic hashing techniques. Um, while this improves upon the exact matching technique because it catches you know, uh, certain uh, uh, um, images or model uh, samples in, within a threshold of a specific distance, this, the limitation is that data points that fall outside the distance threshold uh, would be again missed by the org. Okay, so next up is, okay. Um, so we've looked at this exact matching and approximate matching techniques, but the, the how, about, how about looking at the exclusion itself as a classification problem, right? So a probabilistic classification problem. So what we do here is uh, we wanna predict the model to exclude. So for which we have to train the Oracle, uh, the model for the Oracle itself, right? So what we do here is, yeah. So we get um, a portion of the, the subsets of the data sets and we, we use this data sets to generate feature vectors that would be used as the basis for establishing different classes of models. So if we have N models, we're gonna have N uh, labels uh, on which we're going to train uh, this uh, classifier-based exclusion strategy. Um, the, the natural limitation, while it is, you know, it, it improves upon the limitations on uh, it, or it solves the, pro the, the issues with the, the other two or three techniques I talk, the issue with this one is it can be overfit on members because you're training a model, uh, and we have already said that the, the, the root cause for membership inference is you know, the fact that models are overfit on their members. So it might suffer or it might inherit you know, the same issue. Okay, so that's sort of the, design, you know, the, the limitation by design, but empirically, um, I'll, as I will show later, it's, it's much better than uh, the other ones. And the other alternative that also you know, speaks to the limitation of this classifier-based uh, oracle is uh, how about connecting or using what we call a chain of oracles. So basically, we we query exclusion oracles progressively instead of just picking one of them. So we first start with the exact matching, and when it doesn't find a match, instead of giving up, we go to the approximate matching, and when it doesn't find a match. Again, instead of giving up there, we go to the classifier-based uh, oracle or exclusion as a last resort, okay? So this also turns out to be a, a much better technique, uh, empirically speaking. So let me uh, give you a highlight of you know, how this performs. So I gave you like an overview of the five different techniques that we explored, right? So the model confidence-based exclusion, uh, the exact signature-based exclusion, approximate si signature-based exclusion, uh, classifier-based exclusion, and uh, chain of exclusion oracles. So these are the five um, uh, exclusion strategies that we have tested. So what we have here is uh, results uh, of our defense uh, or the different other, uh, the performance of the different oracles against the undefended model. Uh, for two data sets. On the left is CIFAR-10 data set, and on the right is CHM list, which is a sort of a benchmark medical uh, uh, image classification data set. So on the x-axis, we've got model accuracy, and on the y-axis, we've got the accuracy of the attack. And the, the baseline for the attack accuracy is 50%. So if 
if the adversary gets on average a 50% attack accuracy on a, on a batch of, let's say, inputs, um, it doesn't say much about the effectiveness of the attack because it's, it's equal to random guess. So that's why we are uh, fixing the, the baseline at 50%. So the closer the attack accuracy to 50% uh, is, is good for the defense, it, it indicates a good defense. Uh, and of course, when you talk about attack accuracy, we have to also look at it uh, with respect to model utility or model test accuracy. So that's why every time we measure the effectiveness of a defense or uh, even an attack, we have to look at uh, the trade-off between model accuracy and attack uh, effectiveness. So while keeping the model, the original model accuracy, if the attack could be dropped into uh, the baseline, which is a 50% or random guess, then we can consider that defense to be a good defense because without compromising the utility of the model, we uh, maintain that the attack won't succeed. So the, the blue circle here is the undefended model. So that is the accuracy somewhere between 60 and 80. And as you can see, all the other uh, uh, points are our exclusion oracles which are not too far in terms of uh, model test accuracy, which is good news. And interestingly, they are almost on the baseline or on the 50% random uh, attack accuracy, which shows that the attack is essentially failing. So that tells you that you know, the defense is super uh, effective. Uh, on the right-hand side, you would see the same kind of story, except that this is a different data set, which happens to be a medical uh, image classification. The next thing we did was, okay, so it looks like, um, you know, our defense Mia shield is good enough uh, in, in terms of uh, basically uh, mitigating the membership inference attack and bring it, the accuracy of the attack down to uh, randomness. Then we looked at the defenses that were proposed over the years, over the last five years or so, uh, and these defenses, as I told you earlier, fall into different categories. You know, some are based on differential privacy, others are based on uh, confidence masking, while others are based on model stacking, et cetera, and re regularization also. So uh, we did the same kind of evaluation. So we tested the trade-off between model accuracy and attack effectiveness um, against um, our defense, Miashil, which is the green square, and all other defenses like uh, DPS, GD, so this is differentially private, stochastic gradient descent. Pate is also another ensemble based, um, um, differentially ba differential privacy based technique and model stacking, MemGuard is a confidence masking based, model stacking is an ensemble method and MMD mix up is a regularization based. So as you can see, we've considered uh, you know, a span of uh, model uh, membership inference defense techniques uh, across the board over the last five or so years. So compared to the baseline, which is the 50%, as you can see, um, our defense near shield is right here. So right on the line in terms of accuracy, which means it basically uh, mitigates the attack. And compared to the undefended models accuracy, near shield is almost aligned with the undefended models accuracy, which means without losing accuracy uh, significantly, it is providing a random guess kind of attack uh, uh, attack uh, protection here. Uh, there are some other techniques like model stacking and MemGuard, which are pretty close. And also the MMG technique here, the regularization based technique, which are close to Mia Shield. But as you can see, uh, their attack accuracy on each of them is slightly higher, uh, although they are pretty close to the, in terms of the model accuracy. So overall, our, our defense still uh, is a winner. And more interestingly, when you look at the differential privacy-based techniques, DPS, GD, and Pate, uh, they are super uh, comparable in, uh, in uh, attack, uh, in, in basically mitigating the attack. Uh, and so they're almost the same as Mia Shield. But as you can see the gap between the blue circles horizontally and this um, green triangle and the red square, which is DPS, GD, and uh, and Pate, uh, you can see that differential privacy-based methods, uh, they cost a lot on 
the utility of the model. So that's where our defense is overall much better than uh, you know, almost every, every model that we have tried here, every uh, defense we've tried here. The same is true for the other kind of data sets, CHM stars, the story is uh, more or less the same here, except minor differences. Uh, this, the third thing we did, uh, in addition to comparing um, our defense against existing defense, is any defense uh, has to be tried or tested against you know, a possible adaptive attacks. So uh, one of the, the natural adaptive attacks that we anticipate against our defense is, um, especially in the sense of um, you know, perceptual hashing um, exclusion oracles, is that an adversary would uh, keep just uh, keep perturbing or manipulating this uh, samples until you know the sample uh, is misclassified uh, differently by the model. So for that, we've looked at a range of you know um, data augmentation or manipulation techniques that the adversary would likely perform, uh, specifically by rotating or um, translating uh, inputs. Uh, uh, so here we have got uh, results on the left for CFR10 and uh, the right CHMNIST. So the, the blue line is our defense and the, the black line is uh, the baseline. And the red line shows then defended models uh, accuracy as uh, accuracy versus um, um, accurate attack, attack uh, the, the attack, the attack accuracy versus uh, this manipulation parameter. So as you can see, our our method or our defense uh, uh, maintains the attack accuracy while the attack accuracy of the undefended uh, against the undefended model is uh, much higher uh, in both cases. So this this shows um, that adaptive attacks like this one, uh, uh, which are based on manipulation of inputs, may not succeed overall. So as a, as a takeaway uh, for this membership uh, inference defense, so basically the membership inference defense that we proposed, uh, which is based on this elimination of the, the signal, uh, it, 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 it works. And um, we have seen uh, this across the board for um, you know, multiple data sets uh, and also uh, uh, compared it against existing defenses. Uh, and overall, it, it provides much better utility privacy trade-off. And uh, as I just showed you in the previous slide, it also uh, remains resilient against um, an adaptive adversary that uh, basically monetizes you know, the, their knowledge about how our exclusion oracles might have been designed. All right, so those are the two, um, the two lines of works that I kind of described. So how does this fit into uh, the way I started the talk, which is you know the state of the model, you know what is what are the progresses we have made, and what are the open you know, problems we have uh, in terms of this the grand scheme of making machine learning uh, models trustworthy. Uh, so I took two threats against machine learning models: adversarial examples and membership inference, and tried to kind of walk you through what has been done and what we have added on top of uh, uh, the existing uh, state of the art for defenses. Okay, um, so now for the last part of the talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a much broader take on what we call trustworthy machine learning. So I only looked at the two dimensions, adversarial robustness against um, adversarial examples and Robustness against membership inference attack, which are important, and we have to we have to do this kind of work. But trustworthiness of machine learning is not all about robustness against this adversarial inputs or robustness against this privacy motivated attacks like membership inference. It's much broader than that, right? So uh, uh, on this slide, I'll, I'll just take a step back and try to kind of summarize the progress we've made in different dimensions, including the ones I just discussed and uh, some open um, issues that I consider are important. All right, so in, in the front of adversarial robustness, so techniques like adversarial training, certified defenses, and the moving target strategy that I just described uh, from our work are super useful and they are uh, they're good uh, progress. 
Uh, but on the flip side, what we are struggling with, especially in the sense of adversarial examples uh, these days, is uh, that you know the adversarial example literature didn't move much. Uh, so we're we're gaining some robustness, empirical robustness against, let's say, the previous defense technique, and then somebody comes and breaks these defenses, and so that we're in that cycle of you know um, the classic attack defense arms race. So we, I think, we are at the time where we have to rethink what we call robustness, especially in the sense of adversarial examples. So we have to broadly reason about robustness uh, and um, get out of you know, this well-established robustness uh, assessment in the, in the image domain where you know, the, the, the norms or the distance metric is somehow limited to the classic LP norms. So, um, so I'm not the first to, to say this. A lot of people suggested this and I agree with them. Um, on privacy, um, differential privacy has become sort of the gold standard for what we want a privacy definition to be, mathematically rigorous and provide some, you know, guaranteed um, um, utility versus privacy guarantee uh, uh, that you can empirically uh, verify and also formally uh, support. Um, but beyond what we call the average case metrics that with which we are measuring attack, you know, effectiveness. Um, we have to also look at some realistic scenarios for measuring privacy leakage. Um, and we have to also reason about cross domain formulations of privacy because um, privacy leakage or implications of privacy leakage in one domain may not necessarily translate to another domain, for example, privacy leakage metrics for images versus, let's say, language models may not necessarily be the same because the, the tokens we're dealing with are completely different um, and the semantics uh, of uh, privacy leakage is different as well. And so the, so the adversarial robustness and privacy are the two things that I covered, but beyond this, as I said, we have to also look at trustworthiness from a transparency point of view, which is, um, when machine learning models make decisions on very important uh, tasks, uh, they, we, want to, we want to understand how the machine learning models uh, got to that decision. So there is this you know, explosive line of work in, um, um, in, in literature in, in the so-called interpretable or explainable machine learning, which is, uh, which is useful. But I guess um, what is challenging for moving forward with interpretability or explainability of machine learning models is that, um, you know, these machine learning models are keep growing in terms of size and getting more and more complex. So their black box aspect is just getting more and more uh, bigger. Um, and uh, it's becoming harder to scale up, uh, you know, existing explainability frameworks to uh, the models that we are we're seeing today, which has got you know billions of parameters. Um, so, so that's about transparency. And the, the picture won't be complete if we don't bring in fairness and ethics into the whole equation of trustworthy machine learning here, because uh, you might do a great job on making the model uh, robust against adversarial manipulations or privacy motivated attacks, and you can still make it you know, somehow transparent about its decisions and so on. But if it is um, if it is not fair um, to everyone, or if it is somehow unfair to a specific long tail or you know portion of the data set or a population on which a model is trained, uh, then um, we are not doing things right. So the, the model is not trustworthy, right? So the the idea here is one of uh, one of the you know the progress we've made in in the in the literature of you know fairness and ethics and so on of machine learning or ai in general is this this tendency to quantify or measure fairness and ethics um, the question that might come naturally is is it is it is it okay or is it natural to quantify fairness or is fairness and ethics quantifiable in the first place that's a very big question uh, um, that the the ethics and fairness community has to deal with um, if we have to formulate fairness and ethics, um, we have to have 
some alignment between what humans perceive as fair or ethical um, and try to encode this human values into uh, the formulations of fairness and ethics in machine learning. Um, more importantly, though, um, all these different dimensions of trustworthy machine learning are important. But what is more important is even the dynamics between these different properties that we expect from a machine learning model, right? So um, we have to also study, um, this is a very underexplored or somehow overlooked, fairly overlooked um, area where we have to look at, for example, accuracy versus all these kinds of um, properties that we expect. How does accuracy fare against adversarial robustness, privacy, transparency, fairness, and so on? And then between this different, if you take a pair, let's say uh, robustness and privacy or robustness and fairness or privacy and transparency, um, some of them are seemingly conflicting. For example, privacy and transparency. Um, privacy is all about limiting leakage uh, in the sense of, for example, membership inference. But at the same time, you also want the machine learning model to be transparent about its decision. So how do you fare the two? How do you balance, you know, uh, privacy and transparency? Um, privacy and fairness uh, is the same kind of story here. So um, this is the way I look into the, the whole puzzle of um, trustworthy machine learning in terms of the progress we have made so far and uh, some of the open issues that I consider are important. So um, to conclude, um, the way I want to look into trustworthy machine learning is using this analogy of an umbrella. So in, in the normal sense of an umbrella, right? So you want your umbrella to be reliable um, or trustworthy so that you know it protects you from the things that you anticipate an umbrella will, will protect you against. So if there is a UV ray or light coming from the sun, you want your umbrella to protect you. If there is a rain coming, uh, you have to also expect or anticipate the umbrella to protect you against the, the rain. Or if there is a wind, uh, unless it is a, a storm or something like that, you still have some reasonable belief that you, the, your umbrella will protect you. So you can replace all you know, the, the, the UV rays, the wind and the rain with you know, any threats or any uh, properties that you expect from a machine learning model, like adversarial robustness, privacy preserving, and so on. So if, if we consider um, machine learning as an umbrella and we want it to be trustworthy, this trustworthy machine learning umbrella should include, of course, robustness to adversarial manipulations. It has to be privacy preserving it has to be interpretable or you know, the explainability aspects should be there. It shouldn't be biased to a specific group of people and it should align with the ethical values that humans, uh, reasonable humans would use. But this umbrella also needs some reinforcement, right? So it, it has to, it has to have you know, this united kind of hands that will hold it together so that it doesn't um, flip around. So the, uh, the way I look into this reinforcement is this triangular view of the synergy between academia doing basic research, industry, you know, extending basic, basic research into products and services, um, and the public sector as the mediator between the two because this, the public sector has this authority of doing you know, oversight, you know, auditing, and also uh, reg regulatory aspects uh, through legislations and so on. So these this three entities uh, can work uh, in synergy to reinforce what I call the trustworthy machine learning umbrella, which has to uh, in encompass or have all these properties that I, uh, I mentioned here on, on the umbrella itself. Okay, so with that, uh, I, will, I will stop my talk here and I will uh, look forward to your questions uh, 